it was it was just my fault really so you know if you've never had a lot of money come in before you kind of get carried away so that first year we did a hundred thousand and all of a sudden I, I started getting these crazy eyes and every year we'd start setting the goals higher and higher every year so the like next year I was like okay let's try to double our sales and then the next year let's try to double again try to double again and I was just going all out and driving my wife crazy Steve Chu is uh, the brains behind my wife quit her job. She decided, you know what? I want to quit my job. I don't want to do this anymore. So let's start working from home. And Steve and his spouse uh, dove into creating a business together. However, Steve realized that that uh, things weren't maybe that great. I'm sure he'll tell us that story today. He's got a brand new book about this topic, The Family First Entrepreneur, How to Achieve Financial Freedom Without Sacrificing What Matters Most. We'll ask him about his process of creating, maybe help some stackers out there do this the right way. And I'm super happy he's here with me, mom's basement by the card table. Steve Chu's here. How are you, man? I am good, Joe. Thank you so much for having me. Well, I never realized, dude, uh, before I read your book, uh, what a like professional gambler you are. Like you are, <laughs> you're a big time gambling man. You take all the, all the, 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 the money from the businesses and just pile it on the, I've, I've never heard of this game before, by the way, the Pi Gao table. You've never played Pi Gao poker before? No, I play, okay. it, I play almost exclusively craps when I play. I don't gamble much, but when I do, I'll play craps. Hmm. Okay. So before your audience thinks that I'm an inveterate gambler, uh, <laughs> let me just explain <laughs> Pi Gal real quick. It is the slowest game in Vegas. You could play for hours and not lose any money, but you won't make that much money either. Uh, it's, I'll just explain the rules real quick, just cause we're going to be talking about it. So you're dealt seven cards, you put together two poker hands. And basically if you win both hands, you beat the dealer. If the dealer wins both hands, the dealer wins. And if you just push, meaning you win one, you lose one, no money changes hands. And that is why you can play forever. Now, what does this have to do with what we're talking about today, Joe? Well, wait a minute. Even before we get to that, because I'm yeah. a little confused. So you got like six people sitting around and the dealer's playing one hand against all six players? Or is yes. it just you and a dealer one-on-one? No, 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 no. It's the dealer against six players if the whole table is full. Gotcha. And is there a way to make money faster? Well, Okay. So I don't want to, to get into the get rich quick. There's a way to make money. Okay. So can we just tie all this to before everyone thinks I'm a gambler? (laughs) (laughs) I use this analogy in the book because playing the regular game is like your day job. You're not going to make lots of money. You'll make enough to get by, but you know, you're getting by essentially. Now, what I didn't talk about with Pi Gao is that there's this fortune side bet where if you get a real hand, like three of a kind, a flush, a straight or whatnot, you got to get this slot machine-like payout, okay? So the way I describe in the book, thanks for portraying me as a gambler, by the way, is that your day job is the regular game, and this fortune side bet is like your business that could potentially make you outsize money. So the way I always teach it is, if you want to start a business or if you want to achieve financial freedom, just start a side hustle on the side while you're still working, don't just quit cold turkey to start a business or whatever you want to do. But I think that makes a, a big point, though. There's a lot of people thinking that, you know, maybe I will make a lot of money not going into business for myself. Most of our stackers work for other people. And yet you look at that ladder, Steve. It, it's difficult to climb. It takes forever. You've worked as an engineer. There's a lot of people fighting for very few spaces. And even when you get there, the disillusionment among those people when they reach the, quote, top doesn't feel as great as they thought it would. It does, but it does feel good for a little bit. (laughs) No. Um, Yeah. yeah. I will say this, and and maybe you can just kind of describe your audience to me, Joe, but I would say most people who have a job and they're happy there, they want to achieve financial freedom or they, they might not necessarily want to spend all their time working. And that's why it's important to have that side hustle. It doesn't have to be big and you don't have to have high expectations. You just be able to, you just need to be able to maintain something for a long time and eventually good things will happen. This is the way that I've started all of my businesses. So 
I don't know if you guys know my background, but I sell handkerchiefs online, which is very masculine. Joe, did you tell everyone that I sell handkerchiefs? You I did in that the part out, huh? I did in the open. I did in the <laughs> open. I, I I told them I'm like he sees the best hanky salesman I ever met. <laughs> but, but seriously, this yeah. th- th- this is all around. Well, w- well, let's go ahead and start there. And actually, before we do that, Steve, because I do want to hear the story. It's a great place to start. Because what we're going to talk about today is how really not to start a business in a lot of ways, the way that you did. I think you tell a very cautionary tale that I'd love you to tell so that gets into some of the levers that we need to pull if we're going to do a business correctly. But you, you, you are somebody who initially, you guys were just interested in getting married? We were interested in starting a family, actually. Which marriage, of course, comes first for mo- for most people. And uh, in our case, we live in the Silicon Valley. Joe, I forgot what you I forgot where you live. I'm I'm a Texarkana, uh, Arkansas is 800 yards uh, okay. from my house. I'm in Texarkana, Texas, barely, barely. I live in California, Silicon Valley. Pretty sure it's more expensive. Slightly, uh, or- maybe slightly. <laughs> In order to get a good house in a good school district, we're talking two incomes, two good incomes. And uh, we started this because my wife went up to me and she said she wanted to quit her job. And uh, we started a handkerchief store, as I mentioned earlier. The only reason we decided to sell handkerchiefs was because when my wife and I got married, I mean, the woman is a crier. She cries all the time out of, out of happiness, not, not sadness. And, uh, I love the up. line, by the way, I love the line, Steve, in your book where you're like, I'd be balling if I were married to me too. I, <laughs> I, laugh, I laughed hard when I read that line. <laughs> she wanted a handkerchief, basically. We couldn't find any anywhere except for this factory in China. And then so we imported a bunch, used a handful, and then sold the rest. And that's why the idea for the handkerchiefs came, in case anyone's wondering uh, why I decided to sell such a random product. And that business ended up taking off, replaced my wife's salary in the first year. During that time, I want to slow down in that story just a little bit because you did look, you did look at that time for some other opportunities. You, you like a lot of people, if they're going to go start a business, you're like, okay, let's dig in. The first couple businesses, it it sounded like you looked at were franchises, where maybe yes. it was going to cost you a fair amount of money. Do you, do you like franchising at all? Do you recommend your listeners if they start a a, a business or your readers that they look at franchising? I mean, the benefit of franchising is you're taking their proven formula and applying it. It just costs a lot of money. And I'll I'll run some numbers here. So one of the franchises we were thinking about starting was a Kumans. Do do you know what a Kumans is, Joe? I did. My kids went. Yeah. Kumans is great. And it's it's in line with our values, right? It's a tutoring center, basically. The minimum cost to start that thing was $350,000. Quick money. You just write a check. I mean, you got to get a loan, you got to write a check, and then there's, it takes time to start up. You got to get clientele. And uh, we, it just sounded really risky. Contrast that to Hankies, we only spent $630 to start that thing. I was amazed. How, how did you spend so little money on starting that business? Okay, so first off, Joe, I have to just tell you that we grossly overpay for everything in the United States. Grossly. So something that we sell for like 25 bucks might cost us like 20 cents or 25 cents. Okay. So that's how you can start a business with very little money. So that first order of handkerchiefs, I want to say was 200 bucks. And uh, that was the bulk of the cost. The rest of the cost in that 630 really was a website hosting. And I think I started on Bluehost actually. It was $7 a month back then. And then I got a beater computer. And then back then when I started, which was 2007, I actually had to go out and buy a digital camera because we didn't have phones. Now I'm dating myself, Joe. Right, uh, right. <laughs> Tell us what it was like in the old days, Uncle Steve. <laughs> hey, Joe, are you older than me? I can't remember. I am 55. Okay, you're older than me. I'm 48. Yeah. Okay, so why don't you tell us back in the old days? Uh, did, did we no. have phones back then? No, 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 no. No, <laughs> no I want to continue the story. So you start this business with very little money. You decide not to do the franchise in the Kumon centers and, and some of these other opportunities cost you a lot less to get started. You are more successful than you ever thought that you would have been. But your, your story doesn't open. This book doesn't open with your success. 
This book opens, Steve, with your wife crying on the floor with all these like half-filled orders around her. Paint that scene for me and tell me how the hell did you get there? Yeah. It was it was just my fault, really. So, you know, if you've never had a lot of money come in before, you kind of get carried away. So that first year we did a hundred thousand and all of a sudden I, I started getting these crazy eyes. And every year we'd start setting the goals higher and higher every year. So the like next year I was like, okay, let's try to double our sales. And then the next year, let's try to double again, try to double again. And I was just going all out and driving my wife crazy. Because she was wasn't nearly goals. excited. I'm sorry. She wasn't nearly as excited as you were even then. She was not because we're, I mean, I'm Asian. I'm pretty frugal, Joe. We don't spend that much money. We started the business so we could spend more time with family. But what ended up happening is we just started trying to make as much money as possible even though we weren't even spending like, you know, 10% of it. And that's just a funny thing that happens to entrepreneurs. We kind of get carried away. And I was driving my wife so crazy that, and, and just pushing her real hard, like, you know, both of us to make more money that one day she just broke down and she said, Hey, I don't want to do this anymore. This isn't fun. We don't even spend the money. And we're actually not even spending as much time with our family because we're trying to make all this money. And that's what ended up happening. You would think that this huge success that you're having along the way would make you exactly the opposite. I mean, it's, it's really sad. And what's amazing to me as I was reading your story is that the thing that you would think would have been the best moment ever was the straw that broke the camel's back. You, you find out that you're going to be on the today show. <laughs> like yeah. that, if, if, if I found out that, you know, that Stacking Benjamins was going to be on the Today Show, I'd be ecstatic. And you were ecstatic. But tell me, tell me that story. What happened when you went on the Today Show? Man, I was so thrilled when that happened. And what ended up happening is we were only on that show for 12 seconds. 12, 12, just met, 12, 12 seconds. seconds. So I, I don't even know if that qualifies for being on the show, Joe. Right. Maybe, maybe it does. Maybe it doesn't. But our sales 7 x and it wasn't just for that day because that show aired in different times and different time zones. And we were getting seven X the sales for, I want to say like almost two weeks. And that almost destroyed us. You ever see that? But maybe I'm dating myself again. You ever see that pets.com commercial back in the early internet days where they're like cheering because they got their first sales and all of a sudden it, you know, yes. they get like yes. a million sales and they're like flipping out. That uh, was, us. Oh crap. Oh crap. Yeah. Yeah. No, it was very stressful. So what most people don't realize, and Joe, I know you interview a lot of entrepreneurs as I do on my podcast. You never hear about this stuff, right? You always hear about like the, the glory stories of, you know, how they grew their business to whatever. What you don't realize is that when I hit the stop button on the record, a lot of these guys that I interview who are really successful and they are successful, they're miserable. They're stressed out. They have these goals. They don't actually see their family much. They're estranged from their wives. And that's the story that is untold that I kind of want to tell in that book as well. Well, what about this idea, though, Steve, of the hustle culture, right? We see Gary V talks about, he doesn't say you can sleep when you die, but it's kind of the same message, right? That, hey, we got to hustle. You got to put out more. You got to put out more. You got to put out more. What's the, what's the lie there? Most of us start a business just to hang out more with family or to do stuff that we want to do. You don't have to hustle your butt off if all you want to do is make a couple million bucks. Seriously. So hustle culture, I think, is way overrated because it actually takes you away from the goals that most people start their businesses in the first place. I, I don't want to pick on Gary V, but I know he just got a divorce recently. And I can't imagine that that hustle mentality that he's portrayed for so long was good for his family. Because realistically, you can't hustle that hard and still have the time to, or, or have the mind share, so to speak, to be with your family. Well, you've got uh, an analogy that uh, your friend and a guy who's been on the show a couple of times, James Clear, shared with you about the four burners. And I yes. think this is an important idea for, no matter whether you work for somebody else or for yourself, Steve, I thought this was a very powerful analogy. Can you walk us through the four burners and how you kind of work your burners? Yeah. So... The four burners theory states that your life is composed of four burners. So there's uh, health, work, family, and friends. 
And in order to excel at any one area of those four areas, you have to turn off one of your other burners. If you want to be really good at something, you have to turn off two burners. And if you're Elon Musk, you probably turn off three burners and your work burner is like way up high. Yeah. Basically, the theory is about trade-offs, right? So if you want to have a really strong family, well, you're going to have to sacrifice one of the other burners. If you want your business to really take off, you're going to have to turn something off. There's always some sort of sacrifice. And the sooner you realize that, that you can't have it all, is when you can actually make some fundamental decisions on what your priorities are in life. Most people don't think about their priorities. Most people don't revisit their priorities once they start something. It's funny, as, as I'm hearing you talk, I remember back when I was a financial planner, and I haven't been one in a long time, but when I would encounter an entrepreneur, I would ask him a very simple question, which was, is your business working for you or are you working for your business? And that very simple question, Steve, to your point, 99.9% .9 of the people I met were like, nope, I am now working for my business. My business has taken off and I'm just kind of trying to take the tiger by the tail and I can't, I can't do anything with it. Like, like I, how do I get out of this mess that I created for myself? So you take a completely different approach and your, your approach, it sounds like starts off partly with outsourcing. It, it, it sounds like outsourcing was like a big thing for you and Jen that kind of changed the game for you. So when I say outsourcing, I'm always very careful with that term. I prefer to outsource to robots and computers okay. as opposed to humans. I, I actually hate when I go to an event of entrepreneurs and the first thing that I get asked is how big is your team? Because I don't think that the size of your team is reflective of how successful you are. Like my, my wife quit her job.com makes a million dollars in profit. I literally have one VA in the Philippines. It's about putting together systems and automation, if you can. We just happen to be living in the era of artificial intelligence, which is going to make things a hell of a lot easier. It's about automation, documenting stuff, and there's a bunch of principles. I don't know how in-depth you want to go into this. Yeah, uh, just, just slightly to give people an idea about how different you run your day versus this hustle culture that we yeah. were just talking about. Let me just give you an, an example that I think everyone can understand very clearly. Uh, Joe, and I don't know if you do this, but I'm actually not heavy on social media. And my friends who do social media well, like I have a friend who does Instagram, she posts seven times a day. I have a friend who does really well on Facebook. She posts 21 times a day. And guess what? When they stop posting, the traffic stops. So the reason why I don't focus on social media is because I feel like it's a hamster wheel. Instead, what I do is I focus my time on things where I can just do once and it has lasting value. So for example, search engine optimization. Once you start ranking in Google, you get traffic for a long time. I have articles that I wrote 10 years ago that still generate me traffic. On YouTube, I have videos that I produced three years ago, still get a ton of views and leads. So it's all, it's all about prioritizing your activities so that you get the biggest bang for the buck. So that's one example. Another example that I like, by the way, is that the, the way that you focus on the burners, I want to go back briefly to the burner because you also spend a lot of time, and this is something that a lot of entrepreneurs like, oh, you spend a lot of time on your health. Talk yes. about that. Health is such a huge thing because before I was paying attention to health, I would have lunch and then I'd be done for the rest of the day. I'd have no energy to do anything. And when you focus on your health, all your other burners actually get stronger because you have the energy to follow through. Um, I started this health journey in 2014, and I actually I was going for the six pack at the time. I just wanted that once in my life. Uh, that's a different story. I but, feel like I'm going for the protective <laughs> coating over the six pack. That's what I'm going for. <laughs> I ended up losing uh, 35 pounds, I think, in two months. Wow! By cutting out carbs and I just found that I had so much energy. My brain was never in a fog and I could actually work continuously in a stretch without getting tired. And that just boosted my productivity all around. How do you keep the family burner on and juggle the, 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 the career? Yeah, I, I honestly, the career part, like it, it's all about ego really and controlling the ego. Cause like Problem is, is I'm in these mastermind groups with very successful people such as yourself, Joe, and everyone's telling me how much money they're making, millions of dollars here. I belong to this group at Stanford where it's called the Mayfield Fellows Group, and Kevin Systrom is in that group. Every year we have this retreat. Everyone's starting these 
multi-million dollar companies and telling me about their exits. And I go up and I say, hey, I, yeah, I'm, I'm still selling handkerchiefs, right? So I have this ego issue. And the way I fight it is every single year, I just work on one thing and I just focus on it. And whatever happens, happens. So this year it's launching my book. Last year it was YouTube and I managed to hit 200K subscribers. The year before that it was TikTok. The year before that it was ads. So I just pick one thing and as long as I'm interested, I'm going okay on the ego front. Now to prevent yourself from getting carried away, I must say that my wife contributed a lot to that, especially when she broke down. But today we actually have this document where, you know, if there's an opportunity that comes, let's say, let's say um, I had to fly somewhere to Asia for some amazing opportunity. Well, we now kind of quantify that opportunity. And if I'm going to miss any of my family's activities, we just have a discussion on, you know, whether what's that going to actually do and whether and how that compares and whether it's worth it really. And I would say in a lot of cases, it's not worth it, especially since we don't spend that much money. So, I mean, ideally, and I don't know how many of you guys have read Profit First, you find out how much you spend in a year, you pay yourself that money, everything else is gravy, and that really helps the mentality. That's so funny. I was just about to ask you about Profit First because it sounded like you were singing off the Profit First song sheet right there. <laughs> you quote Gary Keller in, in your book, of course, The Real Estate Billionaire. You write, when you know what matters most, everything makes sense. When you don't know what matters most, anything makes sense. What does that mean? That means you got to have your priorities straight. Because if you're just always off fighting fires and stuff, you're always going to get overwhelmed. I think it also means to me, as you're saying that, it means you're going to go to this, you're, you're going to go to, to these mastermind sessions. You're going to hear the badass stuff that everybody else is doing, Steve, and you're going to start biting off all these other things and the family burner turns off almost automatically. It does. It, it has that effect. I'm not going to say this is, this happened overnight, Joe. Um, I learned all this stuff just through hardship really. And, and driving my wife crazy. And she's a very patient woman. Uh, I mean, I, she caught me on the Dumbo ride once uh, sending out an email blast. Like she literally <laughs> snapped a photo. Like just because you're present with your kids doesn't mean you're actually present, right? You yeah. want to be mentally present with your kids and your family. You could have easily done that on the, uh, what's the one next to the teacups. The teacups are kind of boring. The Dumbo ride's <laughs> badass. Why would you do that on the Dumbo ride versus the teacup? This is the hard hitting interview right here, Steve. This is the, <laughs> for the whole book tour, this is the question that you're going to have to remember. No, I actually want to get onto something else, which is sure. uh, another idea. I've, I've got an entrepreneur that's really frustrating me right now, frankly. And it's because every time he sees something to the Gary Keller point we just talked about a second ago, he sees a sale opportunity, he chases it. And he's always chasing 8,000 different things, thinking this is the path to success. You talk about, with your wife especially, working in your zone of genius. And I get coaching from Strategic Coach, and we talk all the time about this same thing, zone of genius. I want to I want to talk about this because I feel like this is such a powerful concept. And once entrepreneurs realize that, I think the outsourcing comes more naturally. The um, Your ego gets a little bit more in check. Talk about your wife and working in her zone of genius. Yeah, and I think this is something that a lot of entrepreneurs face. Like in the beginning, you're trying to do everything, right? Because you're trying to save money. You're trying to do everything. But realistically, we're not good at everything. There's certain things that we all hate doing. There's certain things that just come really quickly to us. And early on, this, this happened to my wife. Like she was doing all the day to day packing orders. We were all packing orders and she was sewing and doing all this stuff. And that's not, that's not our strength. I mean, that's our, I mean, we can do it, sure. but it's not where our time is best spent. And it wasn't until we, we started outsourcing mainly the stuff that we didn't want to be doing first did we realize that our time was just so much more efficiently spent doing other things, higher level things like growing the business, higher level things like how to market our products or how to portray our products and that sort of thing. Um, that did not happen until like year two or three. I want to give everybody an idea of, of your days as well. You write uh, for you weekdays or your work days from nine to one. That's a nice schedule. I rarely talk to anyone during those times, Tuesday and Thursday afternoons are health days. 
I'll either play ultimate frisbee, you write, or tennis or go for a run. Weekends and nights are reserved for family and friends. You got that all carved out. But you say it doesn't have to be like that. You have a friend who runs ecommercefuel.com, uh, Andrew uh, Yuderin. Is that how you Udarian, pronounce it? Yeah, yeah. Udarian. Mm-hmm. Uh, Andrew, Andrew devotes an entire year to going hard. And then he relaxes. Like he takes monster time offs. And you say you can separate that however you want. Um, but, but it seems to me, if you've got a mind of an entrepreneur, Steve, you know, you write somewhere in your book and an entrepreneur, is somebody that will work 80 hours to avoid working 40 hours for somebody else. I've heard that a lot too. Like, how do you turn it off? How do you actually click that mind fence so that now I am not sending out, uh, emails on the Dumbo ride? <laughs> uh, yeah, as I mentioned earlier, I only do one thing a year now. That's it. I don't try to do like five things all at once because I think when you try to do too many things, that's when you run into problems. Uh, yeah. So uh, that, that Udarian story that you just told was just kind of a way to cheat the burners because you can turn them on and off at any time. Right. And so he chooses to go all out and then he relaxes. That's not my style. So, so I run two seven figure businesses and 20 hours a week. And the only reason I'm able to do that is because I do drop a lot of things on the floor. Like this year is the year of my book launch and everything else is kind of in coasting mode. The other things I'm working on probably aren't going to grow really heavily because I'm focusing on the book and that's all I'm doing this year. But at the same time, you're able to keep the family burner going because of that. The family burner always goes. In fact, my whole afternoon, I'm a glorified Uber driver. (laughs) That's the best way to put it. I've been there. (laughs) People always tell me, hey, Steve, why don't you just hire a driver or something, right? And I'm like, dude, this is where I get all the good stuff. Because when you're driving the car, your kids forget you're driving, and they start talking about all the juicy stuff. Yeah. Like boys who they like, and I'm just like, I'm just kind of like listening in. Uh Uh-oh. So I wouldn't miss being a driver for the world. No, I I miss those days fondly, except when it was 5 a.m. take him to swim practice. That was the one I didn't Uh, like. The 5 a.m. swim practice run was not my favorite. Yeah, that's brutal. Um, there's a lot of people listening to this now. They're like, Whoa, wait a minute. I can do this in a healthy way. I can build a business where I don't have to have the hustle culture. It is possible. What business do I start? Yeah. Let's, let's say that I'm interested in cupcakes. We had, uh, Austin Cleon on, I think, you know, Austin Cleon steal like an artist. Mm-hmm. Austin talked about cupcakes and somebody loves cupcakes and, if it, you know, Steve, the first thing anybody says when you love cupcakes is you should start a cupcake business. Uh, and the yeah. second you start this cupcake business, you effed it all up because you just took all the joy out of the cupcake business, right? Out of making yep. cupcakes. It's no fun anymore. It's like your wife was sewing. She's on the floor because she's way over her head and sewing and sewing and sewing. And it's so boring at that point. So how do you, how do you not get into that predicament? Where do you begin when you're choosing the right business to go into? Okay, so one thing that I always consider is how I'm I going to grow this business without me being in it up front. In the cupcake business, if you're the one baking the cupcakes, that's not going to last. Uh, so the only way are we using cupcakes as an example here? Should, let's do it, man. Okay, let's let's so, lean into it. So the only way that I would personally consider doing cupcakes is if I could somehow license the recipe to someone else and take a royalty. If you guys watch Shark Tank, that's like Mr. Wonderful's like MO right there. <laughs> uh, or if I could contact like a co-packer to create like a mix that I would sell in stores. Uh, but I probably wouldn't go off and just try to sell already made cupcakes unless I had a plan in place. Because even if you contract the baking and all that stuff out, it's still a lot of labor and quality control, I think. Well, but let's uh, let's back away from cupcakes then. Okay. And go back to a question of if it's not cupcakes, then how do I explore it? You say passion is BS. Don't follow your passion. Correct. I would say you should always do something where you have knowledge. Right? So, Joe, in your case, you're a master podcaster. So, I would try to leverage that maybe into a service or content. I would say content is probably the most scalable type of business that you can have. Because it's digital. You produce it once, you can sell it as many times as you want and make the same amount of money. Uh, The only downside for content, and maybe you can share your side here, 
is that it takes a long time for it to get established. Like my blog, I didn't make any money until after two years. I didn't start making significant money until after three years. My YouTube channel, same thing. I didn't start making money until after two and a half or three years. It takes a while. If you want to make money sooner, then you have to actually sell something. And I personally like e-commerce if you want to, if you want to make money within a year because you, you get a physical good and you can sell that and you have this supplier that's giving you a constant supply of this stuff and you find customers. In the long run, if you have the runway, like if you're willing to do this for at least three years, I think content is probably the best play. If you want to make money sooner within a year, sell something, whether it be a service or a physical product. And the good news is, is you tell people, and this is another question I know you get all the time, Steve, do I quit my job right away? And your answer is, oh, hell no. The answer is to play pie gal poker. <laughs> <laughs> nice. It's the yeah. circle of life. D Spoke don't, don't quit the job. Don't, it just, <laughs> you know what ends up happening is you end up starting making decisions based on the money. Because you're in a pinch, you don't have the income anymore. And you can't really run a business that way. So keep the job, do it on the side. Everyone has time. Like I waste so much time even still, and I think I'm pretty efficient. Just cut out TV or, or cut out something that doesn't really directly benefit you, and you'll find the time. Everybody knows that thing. Like anybody yeah. who's hanging out here with us listening, they know the thing where they're wasting time. Like it just, it's, it's, it's there. Your book is The Family First Entrepreneur, How to Achieve Financial Freedom Without Sacrificing What Matters Most. Available everywhere, Mr. Chu? It's available everywhere. And uh, I over-deliver. When you pre-order the book, you will get a three-day workshop on how to start a print-on-demand business. There's a reason why I start with print-on-demand. If you guys don't know what print-on-demand is, this is where you design your stuff and you can sell merchandise where the supplier takes care of fulfillment. You don't have to touch any inventory. I consider that a gateway drug into other e-commerce businesses. You probably won't make life-changing money with it, but it'll get you started and you can start with very little money. I'm also giving out a two-day workshop on how to make money with content. I make money blogging, podcasting, and with YouTube, and you'll learn how to do that there. And I'm also doing a six-week, what I call a family first challenge, where I will walk you through in a Facebook group how to choose your next side hustle. Those are the bonuses. Awesome. And we get them. How do we get there? Immediately. So you go over to the family first entrepreneur, you pre-order the book, fill out a form, and then you'll get a login to a private membership site that has all the bonuses that I just described. Awesome. You know what, Steve, if people are walking the dog or they're commuting to work while they're dreaming about being a family first entrepreneur, we'll have a link in the show notes at stackybenjamins.com. Great talking to you again, my friend. I feel like you're a guy I don't get to talk to enough, and I always learn so much every time I do. And I even learn about poker. <laughs> Thanks for having me, Joe. I really appreciate it.